This week we'll be in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, uh, verses 12 through 20. And I would like to start off just by reading the text. He says, Paul is uh, addressing the church in Corinth, he says, All things are lawful for me, but not all things are profitable. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be mastered by anything. Food is for the stomach, and stomach uh, for, is for food, but God will do away with both of them. Yet the body is not for immorality, but for the Lord, and the Lord is for the body. Now God has not only raised the Lord, but will also raise us up through his power. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I then take away the members of Christ and make them members of a, of a prostitute? May it never be. Or do you not know that the one who joins himself to a prostitute is one body with her? For he says the two shall become one flesh. But the one who joins himself to the Lord is one spirit with him. Flee immorality. Every other sin that a man commits is outside the body. But the immoral man sins against his own body. Do you not know that, the, that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and that you are not your own? For you've been bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body. Uh, for the benefit of those who uh, are visiting or may have missed some of these, I'm going to start with, by way of introduction of what we've been talking about up to this point in, in uh, chapter 6. In chapter 1, there's an introduction where Paul is just saying that all the saints in Corinth, they've been called with a special calling from God. They're called through the gospel and they're sanctified in Christ. Uh, he warns them about exalting men and exalting human wisdom uh, over Christ and, this, and Christ's teaching, spiritual wisdom. In chapter 2, he talks about uh, that his power among them was demonstrated in weakness uh, so that our faith would be in God's power, not in signs and wonders. And he emphasizes the fact that God's truth doesn't come through man's wisdom. It comes through spiritual revelation, and he's an apostle and inspired by the Holy Spirit, so they should listen to him. And that's what he says, God's mystery was revealed through the Spirit. And he implies that spiritual people, people who have the Spirit, people who think themselves spiritual, will accept God's spiritual wisdom. In chapter 3, he talks about the irony that exists in, in the church in Corinth, that while they think they're spiritual, they're divided, and the two can't exist side by side. They had a false view of serpents, uh, God's servants, that some were identifying with Paul, some were identifying with Apollos, some with Cephas. And he's reminding them that, that all these servants were sent to Corinth to help them. They were just servants, and each one had a role. One watered, uh, one planted, one watered, but it was God who was giving all the increase. And in chapter 3, 10 through 15, he reminds them that everything that is built uh, upon in the church that will stand is going to be built on the same thing that was laid, and that is the foundation of Jesus Christ. If we build it on human wisdom, if we build it on human uh, leadership or anything else, and he, he makes an analogy of perishable things, gold, uh, hay, straw, silver, these sorts of things, we have to build upon Christ. He also gives a warning that if anyone destroys the foundation or, and, and the building that God has built, then God will destroy that person. So it's an admonishment for anyone uh, to take this very seriously, this teaching. And he reminds them that all these workers were given to them for their benefit, and they have all these spiritual blessings in Christ Jesus. And so they shouldn't exalt uh, one over another, and they shouldn't exalt themselves over their brethren. In chapter 4, he talks about Christ will judge his servants. They were trying to judge the Apostle Paul, thinking that he was weak, thinking his, his judgments and his wisdom wasn't from God. And he's reminding them that ultimately God's going to judge all servants. He's the servant of, of Christ, and Christ will judge him. He corrects their false view of servants by giving them the examples of the apostles and all the things that the apostles are suffering. And then finally, we talked a bit about this this morning in our Bible class, he appeals to them as a father. He's not trying to shame them and turn them away. He's trying to counsel them and bring them back and exhort them. And he gives them that choice at the end of, the, of that chapter. He can come with a rod or he can come with a spirit of gentleness. In chapter 5, he deals with immorality. There's a man who's sexually immoral with his father's wife, but he's, he's addressing particularly that situation. He's not condemning the sin, all it is sinful. He's condemning the actions or the lack of action of the church by accepting a lower standard than God has, has declared of holiness. He talks about the Passover and the purity and the importance of purity during the Passover and how he's stressing the importance of purity in the church, and so the church should take action against uh, impure people within the church. And so he's encouraging them to judge those who are within the church. And he says, uh, 
he talks about shame on the church in, in chapter uh, 6, specifically involving two brethren who may be disputing against one another and bringing shame on the church because they're not seeking to resolve that internally or find a wise brother among them to solve it. They're going out to court, they're going to law and publicly shaming the church. Uh, he's saying how this is shame on the plaintiff and shame on the defendant because they've already lost if they're, if they're doing this. Uh, this is a contrary because court systems are, are based around retribution and the gospel of Christ is about making peace with people. So, uh, and, and finally, he just wrongs all, he gives a laundry list of wrongdoers and says these people will not inherit the kingdom of God. So when we get into uh, this section of the text, chapter 6, verses 12 through 14, I divided this this way. You may have a different <coughs> idea of that, but chapter uh, verses 12 to 14, we talk about being mastered. We're either going to be mastered by the Lord or mastered by our desires of our body. He talks about food, and he also talks about sexual desires. Uh, the second portion, 15 through 17, is talking about being joined. We're either going to be joined to sexual immorality and sexually immoral people, or we'll be joined to the Lord. And then finally, he talks about the body. We have a choice whether we can dishonor God with our bodies uh, or we can honor God with our bodies. So, uh, the question is, do we abuse our freedom in Christ? This is a good question. Uh, now that we're free from our sin, now that we're free uh, from the law, you know, we read the Old Testament, all these rules and regulations, do we use our freedom and abuse it? Uh, thinking, well, you know, I'm just free from all the rules and regulations, I can do what I want. Does being a Christian give us a liberty to sin? You know, there was a misunderstanding here, I think, in the church in Corinth, and sometimes there's a misunderstanding today. People say, well, you know, I'm free you know, I live by grace, and I'm not under the law, and so I can do whatever I want. And so that's talking about, uh, you know, being mastered by, by something, the Lord or our body. So let's look at verses 12 through 14. He starts by saying, all things are lawful. Now, this is an interesting thing to say. Are all things lawful? Well, yes, but there's a caveat to that. In, in contrast with the law, um, he, he, all things are lawful. They're, uh, they don't, they're not under the law anymore. He, he's going to pick up this idea again. Just, just, we're going to get to this in chapter 10, but he's going to use the same phrase again in chapter 10. All things are lawful. In this, in this use of it, he's saying all things are lawful, but not all things are profitable or expedient. In the next one, he's going to say all things are lawful. In chapter 10, he's going to say all things are lawful, but not all things edify. But why would Paul say this? In, in, in context, it sounds more like a Corinthian statement. They're saying... Does it matter that the, the guy is sleeping with his father's wife? You know, does, does it really matter that, that all these people are doing this or that? It seems like they are saying, uh, and perhaps misunderstanding what Paul had said earlier. They were using their freedom uh, to sin. And Paul gives warnings of this in other places. I'll read this. You can stay in chapter uh, 6 if you want there. But I'm going to turn over real quick to Galatians 5 and verse 13. This is clearly not true uh, if, if they're misrepresenting it. Because he says in uh, chapter 5 and verse 13 of Galatians, For you were called to freedom, brethren. Only do not turn your freedom into an opportunity for the flesh, uh, but through love serve one another. So sometimes people use their freedom as an opportunity to sin. And so I think that's what he's addressing here. Uh, just real quick, I'll, I'll give another one. 1 Peter 2 and verse 16. 1 Peter 2 and verse 16 says, Act as free men, but do not use your freedom as a covering for evil, but use it as bond slaves of God. So I think that perhaps the Corinthians had taken something that Paul said and twisted it. So he's having to correct that teaching. Remember, he had to, before he wrote to them and said, do not associate with sexually immoral people. But they had misunderstood that. And, and so he had to correct that. He says, no, I'm just talking about people among the brethren. So here's some other statements that you can see how they may take it out of context. Romans 8, 1 says, there's no condemnation in Christ Jesus. Well, that's true, but you have to explain that. Somebody say, well, you know, I'm in Christ, so you can't condemn me of anything. Well, that's not what they're saying. That's not what should be said. And Romans 6, 14 says, we're not under law, but under grace. You can see how somebody may twist that and say, well, you know, I'm not bound to rules and regulations of the Bible. I'm, I'm just going to live in the grace of Christ and do whatever I want to do. Galatians 5.1 says it was for freedom that, that Christ has freed us. So, so you can see how they may have taken some of Paul's statements. These are kind of things that Paul had said, not that he wrote these things before he wrote to the Corinthians, but this is some statement. This is the kind of way that Paul talked as he was inspired through the Spirit. So you can see how they may be misunderstanding that. So Paul was probably correcting a false view in the same way that he was correcting a false view back in chapter 5 and verse 10 
in regards to sexually immoral people. Well, he's not, he doesn't deny that we have freedoms in Christ. He, so he, he agrees. He says, yes, you know, all things are lawful for me, but not all things are profitable. So he's having to correct them. You know, yes, I'll give you that, that all things are lawful, but not all things are profitable, meaning expedient or helpful. Uh, we know that it's not always best to exercise our liberties. He's going to address this again in chapter 10, verse 31, when it talks about eating of meats and stuff like that. Um, and I'll just read that real quick. It's a little sneak preview. He says, Whether then you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. So all things are lawful, but not all things are profitable. So, he's, so you guys, you Corinthians, you need to be careful about this. And I think we need to be careful, too, that just because we have some liberty in Christ, it's not always best to exercise it. We need to do all things to the glory of God. Again, he follows up that on the heels of this in, chapter, in, in verse 12, chapter 6, verse 12. He says, all things are lawful for me, so he, he says it again, but I will not be brought under the power of anything. And some translators have translated that, or any one. Um, but even though something is lawful for me, I can become a slave of even good things. Let's say, for instance, uh, sexual relations. With a man and a woman, you can say, is sexual relations lawful? We have to have a caveat there. Yes, it is lawful in the context of a marriage uh, where, where God has designed that. And then, but can somebody become addicted to the sexual appetite? Well, absolutely. Uh, eating of, of certain meats. In the Old Testament, there, you couldn't eat certain meats, this and that. Well, all things are lawful now. But can you see how uh, you know, overeating could be unlawful? The proverb writer uh, warns about you know, gluttonous eaters of meat and that sort of thing. So you could become a slave of your belly. You know, I'm just, I'm just going to be driven along by all these desires. And there's even support groups of people who are addicted to food, just like there's support groups of people addicted to alcohol and other things. So we can be a slave of even good things. He's not going to be mastered by anything. Somebody could be mastered by drugs, alcohol, uh, even something as innocent as like caffeine. You know, if I don't have my caffeine, you know, I'm going to be grumpy. Or I'm going to be mastered by my sexual appetite or my food appetites. And... Um, I put, I put 2 Peter 2.19 there because that, that verse says that some people promise freedom, but then they themselves are, in, are slaves to some kind of sin. I think this might have been what's going on in the Corinthian church. The Corinthians are saying, and misunder, misquoting Paul, saying, we're not, we're not under the law anymore. We're, we're, in, we're, at, we're free in Christ, and so we can exercise these liberties. We don't have to really pay attention to sexual immorality or food restrictions. Just live and eat and whatever you want to do. But... They themselves, in saying that, had become enslaved to their own desires. They had enslaved themselves to sexual desires or other things. And I think probably in the context, his main uh, objection here is their slave and being enslaved to sexual desires. If you have a different idea about that, we could talk about that after the lesson. The question for us to ask is, do we have any freedoms that we've enslaved ourselves to, that, are, that are really have control over our bodies? Christ has, has purchased us to set us free to serve him, have we gone back and exercised that freedom and become enslaved to something? That's a good reflection for us. He talks about, in, in verse 13, he says, Food is for the stomach and the stomach is for food. So, in other words, dietary restrictions of the law have been removed. Now, this largely could have been a, we don't know if this is, if he's repeating something that was a slogan in Corinth, could have been. They could have reasoned something like this. Well, you know the stomach, what is the purpose of the stomach? Well, it's to digest food. It gets hungry. It, my, it tells my brain I'm hungry. I put food in it. It tastes good. feels good. Exercise it. It's good. God made it. Well, you can see how they could say that to other desires. My body, I have sexual organs. Men and women have sexual organs. They have sexual, tells their body of sexual desires. It's good. You know, God said it's good. Exercise it. You know, just do whatever you want. See, the, see that logic you see? Uh, could have been flawed. Perhaps that's what they're doing. Well, we know that dietary restrictions have been removed, but does that mean that they should indulge just every desire that their body has? No, well, certainly not. He says God will bring both this and these to nothing. I Meaning, ultimately, he's talking about the stomach and the foods here, that ultimately there's not going to mean anything. So he corrects it in verse 13. He says, the body is not for sexual immorality. I think perhaps that they were trying to make the argument about food in the stomach, you know, to, to analogy to sexual desire, just natural. So exercise it. God made it. 
Um, and the world indulges, this is what the world does. They indulge in every sexual desire, greed, food, whatever they want. If the body wants it, just give it. You know, if it feels good, do it. And some Christians were using this kind of logic to excuse sin. Now, as 1 Peter 2.16 says, we don't use our freedom as a covering or to conceal any kind of evil. So that's, that's a misunderstanding. Have you ever heard logic like this? We're human. It's only natural. You know, that's what the media tells us. You know, if, you, if it feels good, do it. Uh, maybe even Christians, uh, people in the denominational churches may say, well, we're not under law, we're under grace, so whatever I want to do, it's fine. I can't lose my salvation. Uh, Christ has freed us from all those laws. You know, you're too legalistic. And so there's a lot of false views out there. But ultimately what we're talking about is either being mastered by the Lord or being mastered by our desires. We, we sometimes fool ourselves into thinking that we're free but yet, at the same time, we're enslaved to some kind of desire, you see. So do we excuse our own sin in that way? That's the question we want to ask. Is there something that we're enslaved to uh, currently, and we're thinking that, oh, I'm just, I'm just exercising my freedom in Christ. So he, he corrects this idea here uh, in verse 12. He's, uh, verse 13, is it uh, verse 13? Uh, yeah, verse 13. He says, the body is for the Lord, and the Lord is for the body. And notice verse, back in verse 12, he talked about not being mastered or not being under the power of any. Now he's going to talk about the real power, and that is the power of, the God, of God to raise the body. See, your body has desires, but ultimately that's not going to help you in the day of the resurrection. But coming under the power of Jesus Christ, that is going to raise your body. So who has the real power here? Is it your body, that you're going to be a master of your body and your own desires, or are you going to be submitting yourself to God and actually uh, being raised, because uh, he raised both the Lord and he will raise us up through his power in the end. So I think that's the distinction he's making there. Uh, and I've struggled with this, because sometimes he seems like he's jumping from topic to topic, but as you look at it, I think he's making one logical, tight argument. So it, it may have gone something like this. They may say, well, the food's for the belly and the belly's for food. Well, that's true. And so they would say, well, sex is for the body and the body is for sex. But that would be false, you see, because it's not a similar comparison. And, and what he's doing is he's correcting this and saying, no, the body is for the Lord and the Lord is for the body. So I think that's, that's the logical flow there that he's, he's presenting. So are we submitting to our body or are we submitting to God? And I hope that we're submitting to God, submitting to Christ, and not to the desires of our own body and just using it as an excuse to sin. He transitions his argument here in, in verses 15 through 17. He talks about being joined, and he's going to give uh, two examples. Either We can either be joined to the Lord, or we can be joined to a harlot or a prostitute. And he says, uh, have you not known three times throughout the rest of this chapter? Uh, and I'll just list them briefly here, then we'll go into them in more detail. Have you not known that your bodies, that's the first question, have you not known that your bodies are members of Christ? So he's assuming that they know this. Next he says, have you not known that the one being joined to a harlot is one body with her? So he's, that's the second thing he assumes that they should know. And then the third one is, have you not known that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit among which you have from God and you're not of yourselves? So these are three things they should have known and he's going to use this rhetorical argumentation to get them to stop abusing their freedom to sin and start living and glorifying Christ in their bodies. So the first one is, have you not known that your bodies are members of Christ? Now the word member here is, is not what we would think of as like if you join a country club, you're a member. Literally it means your limbs, uh, like arms, legs. The, he, he's, the, the word here that's this members in your translation is really body parts. Uh, so you, your bodies are really part of something greater. Your limbs are body parts of Christ spiritually. Each one of us is a part of Christ's body, is what he's saying here in, in chapter 6 and verse 15. So he says, should I take the members of Christ, the body parts that have been joined to Christ, and join them over to a harlot, to something that's unclean? Should I take something holy and join it to something that is unholy? And he says, may it not be, is literally what it says. Your translation may say, God forbid, or may it never be. And the English translators have a hard time translating this because in the Greek it is so emphatically no that it's hard to translate it. Literally it means may it not be. But in our English we might say, no way! Exclamation point. But how do you say that in writing? Well, in the Greek you would say it may it not be. 
Uh, in Romans 6, I think in, chapter, in verse 4 and 5, where he says, should we keep on sinning so grace may abound? He says, no way, you know, may it never be. So he uses that phrase in Romans a lot. And so we would say, never, you know, exclamation point. But in the Greek, it's just, it's emphatically no. Should I take something holy, part of God, part of Christ, and join it to a harlot? So, well, certainly not. Everybody would agree with that. Christ's body is not meant for any sexual sin. He's using the example of the prostitute here. But I think we could e e equally apply this to any kind of sexual immorality that's occurring. Um, is, it only, is it only bad if I, if I pay a prostitute? No. He's talking about any sexual sin. This is the one he's addressing right now. In fact, what m many translators translate prostitute, uh, probably a another good translation would be harlot. And a harlot is somebody who's a woman who's sexually immoral, whether or not she gets paid or not. <laughs> so, so it doesn't always have to be for pay. And in fact, in our society, you think of all the pornography that's easily accessible and just feeds that sexual desire. We're taking members of Christ and we're just, you know, adjoining it to all this filth that's online. Uh, so in the second question here in verse 16 says, Have you not known that one being joined to a harlot is one body? And you may scratch your head and say, well, how is it one body? And he, he, declared, he, he says that for God has said, or he declares, that the two become one flesh, or the two unto one flesh is how I translated it. <clears throat> this goes back to Genesis chapter 2, verse 24, where God made man and woman. And Adam and Eve came together and became one flesh. Well, how does that happen? Is, that, is he saying that um, if, if me being married to Fiona, uh, if I went out and visited five harlots, I'd be married to you know, five different harlots plus Fiona? He's not saying that. What he's saying is that there's a union here that occurs between a man and woman. He's talking about a, a sexual union, a coming together, two bodies. See, God, God made Adam. And he, out, of, out of the sight of Adam, he made another corresponding part, male and female sexual organs. And when they come together, they come together one flesh. The birth of a child is the ultimate product of that. The two have become and produced one flesh. And so what's happening here is, should we take something that's been spiritually joined to Christ, and you know something about how sexual union works and how intimate it is and how it's bringing together, should we do that? No, he's saying that we should not. Um, Ephesians 5, verses 31 and 32, when he's talking about uh, man and woman being married, he says, great is this mystery. <laughs> you know, great is the mystery of, of the two becoming one flesh. And then he clarifies that and says, but I'm talking about Christ and the church. And he's even realized, how do you, I've never actually heard anybody explain uh, fully satisfactorily, uh, satisfactory to me how uh, the two become one flesh, because there's an emotional component, there's a physical component, there's the, all these different ways in which um, sexual union uh, joins people. Uh, that, that's why when you do it in a, in a way that's not pleasing to God, it causes emotional scars, it causes uh, physical uh, uh, harm, and all these, all these problems. So Paul is appealing uh, uh, again here to something that was written before the law. So if they're going to say, well, we don't have to listen to this because we're free from the law, he's appealing all the way back to creation. You know, you should know that the joining of together of, of man and woman as, as flesh goes all the way back to the creation account. And then he says, the one being joined to the Lord is one spirit with the Lord. And that's what they should be doing in verse 17. We're joined to Christ. How? We're in mind and heart. We share the same goals uh, as Christ would want us to have. Our actions should be like Christ. And so that's where we should be doing and not being joined to sexual immorality. So if you look at this whole argumentation here, this is, this is kind of po poetically how it would be structured. There's a fancy word for this named, called uh, chiasm, or that's the structure of this. He's saying that their bodies are members of Christ's body. Therefore, they may not be members of a harlot. They're joined, you know, if they're joined to a prostitute, they become one body. But if you're joined to Christ, they become one spirit. And so that's what he's trying to get them to think about is really, let's not join ourselves to sexual immorality. Let's join ourselves to one spirit in Christ, which is what we've committed ourselves to do. And so let's act like that. If we're spiritual people, let's not be acting like we're, we're of the flesh. So our question for us to reflect on is, have we done this? Have we become one spirit with Christ? Or are we joining ourselves to sexual immorality? Uh, are, we, are we indulging in our fleshly desires? Uh, whether it be sexual appetite or others, have we become enslaved to those things? So the last thing uh, that brings us to the last point point of this section is verse 18 through 20, which is we have a choice to make with our body, whether or not we're going to dishonor God 
or we're going to honor God and bring glory to him. He says in verse 18, he just comes right out and he says, flee sexual immorality. Mine has a period after that. Yours may, yours may have an exclamation point. Uh, he's going to say this again in chapter 10 and verse 14 about idolatry. He's going to say, flee idolatry. But right now he's saying, flee sexual immorality, which this is an emphatic thing. I underline flee here because it's run away from it. Don't be around it. Sometimes we think that we can be around it and not be tempted, and that's when we get uh, stuck. There was an old uh, Kenny Rogers song that says you need to know when to hold them and know when to fold them. Know when to walk away, know when to run. I mean, there are certain situations where you need to run. A uh, good example of this is Joseph ran from Potiphar's wife. He didn't stick around and uh, reason with her or think, well, you know, I know this woman's trying to throw herself at me, but, you know, I, I, don't, I can resist that. He knew that he was a man uh, with certain desires, and she was tempting him, and so he got out of there. This is a good lesson for us as adults or Christians. If we're in a certain work environment where there's somebody and we're feeling like it's a dangerous situation, get out of there. Uh, young people who may be uh, in a dating relationship, uh, especially you know, once you get older and if you have a lot of opportunity to be alone with one another as you're, as you're dating and courting, you're thinking, well, you know, this won't happen to me. You know, we're both Christians and we're stronger than that. No, God says to flee those situations, to flee sexual, sexual immorality. Uh, think about it when, um, in Matthew 24, when, when Christ is warning about the judgment on Jerusalem, he says, when you see these things, get out of town. You think they stuck around? Uh, no, they got out of town. Josephus says that none of the Christians were in there because they took the warning seriously. My point is, when God says to flee something, we need to take the warning seriously and get out of there. And so I hope that, that uh, will be heeded. Uh, verse 18, he says, Every sin which a man may commit is outside the body. Now, this is something that I really had to think about. <laughs> but he says, sin, uh, you know, sexual morality is something that one commits against his own body. Well, how is that true? Well, I don't know that I completely understand this, but this is the way I, this is my thinking on it so far. Well, if you think about the laundry list of sins that he gave earlier in the last chapter or two, he talked about thieves, murderers, revilers, swindlers, all these things. These are hurting other people. But sexual immorality, what I'm doing is I'm taking my body and I'm committing sin against my own body with my body. You know, And um, you could argue that all these other sins you're doing with your body, but there's something that is, that is different about sexual immorality because we're, we're committing it against our own body. We're hurting ourselves. The body itself is what we're what we're abusing, what we're hurting, emotionally, uh, spiritually, physically. And we need to think about this. Do we own our bodies? Multiple choice tests, most of you would say no. I don't own my body, God owns my body. But on a daily basis, we treat it as if God didn't own it. I'm going to do whatever I want to with it. I'm going to exercise whatever desire it spits up and tells me to do. I'm just going to do that and do this like I'm not even mastered by the Lord uh, whatever, whatever, you know, if I feel like uh, consuming this thing, I'll just, you know, eat, eat a bunch of those <laughs> or whatever. Um, a lot of people, they, they indulge in alcohol or other things. They're not thinking about the fact that their body is not theirs. Do we, do we make every decision regarding our body as if it was owned by God and we're, we're a steward of it for God? And so the third question of it in, in verse 19 is this, have you not known? that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. Now, it's interesting that he talk, that the, the you here, your body, is plural. So it is a slight chance that he's talking to them collectively as the church. I'm not sure about that, so I'd like to hear your comments on that, but I do know this does apply to the individual body. He says, your, temple, your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit uh, in you, which you have from God. Now, how is the Holy Spirit in us? That I don't know. Uh, the, the, the phrase that most translators give is in you, other places in the book is translated among you. So like earlier in the first, I think the second chapter, he said, I declared to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. It's the same phrase here. So perhaps he's saying that the Holy Spirit is among them. Perhaps he's saying that the Holy Spirit is in the individual, perhaps. I'm not sure about that. I welcome your feedback. But in, in, in any case, without, without um, it doesn't change the whole meaning of what he's trying to say, and that is 
that God has, has bought our vessel, and it's a, it's a vessel to be used uh, for God, for his purpose, and spiritual people should respect the body. So how are we treating God's temple? You know, am I, am I treating my body as a purchased possession that, that it should be used for God's purposes and glorifying God in it? In verse 19, he says, you're not of yourselves. Are you not of yourselves? Right, don't you know that you're not of yourselves is really the, the gist of that. In, in verse 20, he says, you were bought with a price. Now, I've been, I just read over this. You were bought with a price. Oh, yeah, I was purchased by the blood of Christ. But there's more significance in that. If you look at 7 and, and verse 22, he's talking about how slaves are now free uh, in Christ. For he who was called in the Lord while a slave, he's the Lord's freed man. Likewise, who, who was called while a slave, uh, what, likewise, he who was called while free is Christ's slave. And that's the idea here, is that we are bought with a price. This is a slavery analogy, that we are now Christ's property. We are now Christ's slave. So your body is not your own. He says, do you not know that you're not of yourselves? Really, you're purchased by someone else. And so act like it. Therefore, glorify God in your body. Uh, if you, this, this concept is foreign to us because we live in a day and time where slavery is not permitted. But if you did own uh, a slave or a servant, you would expect that servant to do what you wanted to do. And they would even, uh, if you had a servant, they would even take care of their body in the way that, that you would want them to take care of their body. Everything would be submissive. Uh, if, if that, if that uh, slave took on a wife, well, you're going to be affected by that because you're supporting that slave. And if he had, was sleeping with all the other slaves and had all the children, that's causing drama for you because you're the owner of that slave. Um, if, he, if he sat around and, and, and for whatever reason wasn't taking care of his body, well, you're going to not get as much work out of him, you see. So in every way, the slave was supposed to do things and make decisions based on his master and the, and the, and the return that he would bring for his master. And so in this, in this case, we were bought with a price, so we need to glorify God. And glorify means to bring honor to God. We, we live in such a way that brings honor and glory to him, uh, brings reverence. We magnify him in the sight of others. So again, I think that's the lesson for us today. I hope it was beneficial that in, in terms of being mastered, we have a choice. Are we going to be mastered by the Lord, or are we going to become mastered by the desires of our own body? We have to make that decision every day. It's not a one-time decision that I say, oh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to follow the Lord, and then 10 years later, you know, you're expecting that initial commitment to just be all that was needed. No, every day we make that de decision. Every moment we make that decision, whether or not I'm being mastered by the Lord in my body. Being joined, am I being joined spiritually to the Lord, or am I being joined spiritually to the world and the things of the world, following the, my desires, sexual immorality and other things? And my body, what am I doing with my body? Am I, am I caring for my body in a, such a way that it's a purchased possession to bring honor and glory to God? Or just thinking, like the Corinthians may have thought, well, the body is evil, the body is temporary, you know, food for the body, body for food, you know, whatever I want to do, and just not even thinking about how it might bring glory to God. So I hope we'll think about those things. Have you been living as if you owned yourself? Or are you living as if you're owned by God? Will you submit to God's ownership? If you haven't been doing that, I'd ask that you would think about submitting to God's ownership. If you're a Christian, you've already been purchased, so you need to start acting like it and start living like it and start thinking like it. Are you honoring God in your purchased body? Uh, I hope that we are, but perhaps some of us have not been honoring God with the body that he purchased through the blood of his son. Perhaps some of us here have never actually accepted uh, God as our master. He's paid the price, but we have to receive the redemption. He's, he's, he's offered to purchase us, but we have to accept the offer to make him master and lord of our life. If we haven't done that, we need to consider doing that this morning because ultimately what God wants is he wants us to be a part of his body. What I'd like for you to take away from this lesson is that the body is for the Lord. That's what this section of text is all about, is to help us to bring into remembrance and bring us our thinking back into line that the body is for the Lord. And that applies to all of us. Uh, if, we, if we don't submit to that, one day we'll be in judgment and eternally separated from God. But his design is so that we can become part of Christ's body. If we haven't done that this morning, or if you've made that decision but you haven't been living like it, 
I'd ask you to repent before it's too late. Maybe somebody needs some special prayers or somebody needs help becoming part of Christ's body, and we invite you to do that this morning as we stand and we sing.